Hello, my friends. Good Christmas to you. Uh, DK and Scout the Wonder Dog greeting you from what is now a lovely 48 to 50 degree sunny day with snow melting all around. I understand. However, for those of you in the Midwest and the East, you may well still be under what the newscasters are calling possibly the worst Christmas storm in memory, if not in American history. Some of you have weighed in on a thread I sort of lightheartedly put up yesterday about the storm. God is shouting at the top of his lungs. I hadn't even thought of that when I put up the post. But on reflection, as I begin to get into this study today, um, I understand that they may have well been speaking for the Lord. Um, and I'm not just trying to make up signs and portents in the heavens as much as I am trying to be sensitive and observant of the signs of the time. So with that as sort of an unexpected intro, uh, I will say also parenthetically that I had to battle my way to get to the desk today. I'm not going to go into detail, which provoked two thoughts in me this morning when I was getting ready. One, I'm totally off base, Lord. You don't want me to give this. So I prayed that way for some period of time early in the morning before the sun rose. Or this is a really important message that the enemy of the Lord doesn't want to have presented. We'll let you decide at the end of this. Let's pray and begin. Father, I thank you and praise you that as poorly as I felt at 4.30 this morning, feeling uh, pretty much 100% now, been quite a ride for these last five or six hours. I thank you and praise you in that context for being faithful to me to get me to the desk and in front of the camera to present this information to the body of Christ and for those who are interested in becoming a member of the true body of Christ, not having anything to do with me, but everything to do with the message. Holy Spirit, you as always are the master teacher. I ask you, sir, please uh, shape my words, not only the content, but the form, the tone, the pace, all of it. This belongs to you. This hour belongs to you in Jesus' name. Amen title of our study today, uh, an unusual one for Christmas Eve. I scrolled back and found out last year I also did an unusual Christmas Eve study. I'm just kind of an unusual old guy. Notes on leaving Babylon 2. I'd done one of these over a year and a half ago, but this is completely different. A Christmas Eve call to spiritual freedom from the true king of Christmas. Uh, the scripture for today is not the one you might expect. It's from Ephesians 5, 11, and 12. About 10 days ago when I got this scripture, I immediately was triggered to point it toward the topic that we're going to discuss today. Here it is. I've given it before, but today you get it down, down into the weeds, down into the roots in detail with application. Do not participate in the worthless and unpro unproductive deeds of darkness. There's no wiggle room here. It is an absolute command from our king. Do not participate in the worthless and unproductive deeds of darkness, but instead expose them in the Amplified Version by exemplifying personal integrity, moral courage, and godly character. For it is disgraceful even to mention the things in detail. Such people practice in secret. May God richly bless the reading of his word. I have an early definition of ancient Babylon here. We're not all uh, experts, neither am I. I can read, though, about ancient Babylon, because as you know, who've listened and listened to me and read my stuff uh, over the past two or three years, I'm and have been for all of my academic life deeply interested in roots. God created the universe cause and effect. Therefore, Newton wasn't the first one to understand that roots have everything to do with consequences. So here's a little bit of the roots of ancient Babylon. The Tower of Babel, uh, or Babel if you prefer, stood at the very heart of the vibrant metropolis of Babylon in what is today called Iraq. It was a city of open squares, broad boulevards, and narrow winding lanes. But the city of cities, as Babylon was known by the ancients, eventually fell into ruin, and that's going to be a a metaphorical uh, uh, jumping off point for us. 
It was founded, by the way, significantly by Nimrod around 2250 BC, who was the son of Cush and grandson of Ham, sons of Noah, whose name has become proverbial as that of a mighty hunter. Significantly, again, Nimrod, this is according to the editors of Encyclopedia Britannica and Jewish Encyclopedia combined, Nimrod is the prototype of a rebellious people. Selah. Think on that. Roots and Nimrod, Babel and Babylon. Once more time, one more time. Nimrod is the prototype of a rebellious people, his name being interpreted as, and I quote, he who made all the people rebellious against God. There is a legacy here. Now I will argue to the welcome of some and the chagrin of others that America has inherited a great deal of this legacy. More on that later. Some quotations first from Hammurabi's Code of Hammurabi, dated about 1755 BC. Interestingly, the Code of Hammurabi is cited much more often than the Ten Commandments by many scholars. Ten Commandments coming just a little bit after that at Sinai. Anyway, uh, here's, here's a quote that I've not read before. Just found a little mistake. When Anu the Sublime, king of the Anu, Anunukai, and Bel, the lord of heaven and earth, who decreed the fate of the land assigned to Marduk, the overruling son of Ea, god of righteousness, dominion over earthly man, and made him great among the Igigi. They called Babylon by his illustrious name, who made it great on the earth. This cry for a nation and a people to become great issues from the bowels of the most abominable city in the earliest period of human history. Can't make that point enough, but I'll make it several times today. Uh, also from David Wilkerson, here's a introduction of a controversial thesis I brought up twice before, but not elaborated on. <clears throat> this is from David Wilkerson in a sermon delivered on January 1, 1982, Babylon is Falling. He quotes, Professor Milligan in 1885 wrote, Babylon is not the Church of Rome. I agree. In particular, no doubt that church is deeply sinned, and so has the Protestant church, but it is not the spiritual harlot. Babylon, listen to this, is all, i got to get this right, Babylon is all professed Christians who love the world's favor. I love that as the first part of the definition rather than its reproach. Babylon is all professed Christians who love the world's favor rather than its reproach. We're going to step on lots of toes today. It is those who esteem the honor of the world rather than its shame. It is those who love ease rather than sacrifice, grasping, covetous, but having no compassion on the poor. Babylon is all who anywhere profess to be Christ's little flock but who are not, because they deny him by their action, by their conduct. First thoughts. There's a new movie out called Babylon. I don't recommend you go see it. I've watched the trailer a couple of times, and that's quite enough, thank you very much. And I'm no prude. I'm just saying. Um, I'll, I'll describe why in just a second. It's supposed to be released December 25th, 2022. Isn't that sweet and special? Uh, Christmas Day release. Here's a taste of the film's content in a synopsis written by Ann Brody in What She Said Talk, an online journal of hers, on December 23rd, just uh, yesterday. If you can get by the lurid first act, you'll find Babylon's value. So an hour of scatological dreck and two hours of character development, plot, actual emotion, replacing jolts per second. Hollywood history, and one filmmaker's redemption, the idea, not new by any stretch of the imagination, is that Hollywood's early years were decadent. And they still are. Roots are important. I'm going to argue that Babylon was despicable from the start. 
and it is all the more going to be abominable in the last days. I'm even going to argue that America was less than as pure as we've been taught at its inception, and we're inheriting some of the darkness and the violence and the compromise of our earliest founding. Had a lecture, presentation, sermon, whatever I did, on that a couple of weeks ago, so you can go back for reference. I know I'm going to make a lot of patriots angry today. Without apology, roots, again, are always terribly deterministically important. Without apology, then, I offer this to you as introduction to what we're going to cover today. America and America in breathtaking moral freefall. That shouldn't be surprising to any of you. I've written before that the roaring 1920s, call that for the very <clears throat> reason that it, it roared, serves an historic benchmark for the acceleration of America's last decline, or America's rapid decline. I've argued for two years now that beginning in 1900, especially fast forwarding 120 years, the time period that God gave America <coughs> to repent. I'm fine. Every time I talk, I get dry. Um, that began in 1900. Here's one illustrative commentary to bolster that claim by Joshua Zeitz, an American historian, author, and considered authority on American political and social history. Listen to some of what he says. <clears throat> with which I totally agree, whether he's Christian or not. Truth is truth, wherever you find it. The 1920s heralded a dramatic break between America's past and future. Before World War I, the country remained culturally and psychologically rooted in the 19th century in translated terms in roughly biblical Christianity. But in the 1920s, America seemed to break its wistful attachments to the recent past and usher in a more modern era, modernism. The most vivid impressions of that era are flappers and dance halls, movie palaces, drunkenness, radio empires, prohibition and speakeasies. While sh scientists shattered the boundaries of space and time, aviators made, me made men to fly and women went to work. I'm just saying, that's history. You make of it what you want. But in the 1920s, very important observation by this writer. It became an age of extreme contradictions. I love this part because it's accurate. The unmatched prosperity and cultural advancement of America was accompanied by intense social unrest and reaction. The same decade that bore witness to urbanism and modernism also introduced the Ku Klux Klan, prohibition, nativism, and religious fundamentalism. America at that point stood at the crossroads between innovation and tradition, and it chose innovation, not tradition. So there's a cultural revolution that was launched in earnest in the 1920s that we can clearly see, if you love to read history, as it, as it occurred, we can clearly see the rebellious spiritual platform on which the United States was rebuilding itself. Not building, refashioning, rebuilding. Which would ultimately prove our destruction as repeated it many times over in the 1960s, a decade that I was very close to and participated in in many, if not all, of the worst ways. Drugs, sex, rock and roll, the 1960s a grandson of the 1920s. So it is that 100 years ago in the 1920s, we embarked upon the 2020s redux all over again, but on steroids. What we're seeing in the 2020s, in my view, is drastically, radically more severe to that root system, the part that was good in our founding, than either the 1920s or the 1960s. We inherit those two revolutions in full now. And the 2020s, I believe, I believe more and more, is going to begin to define what I state here as the end of the American order. I remember a uh, Time Magazine owner, name slips my mind right now, wrote about the American century right after World War II when it seemed like we were going to last a thousand years and we were just 
we were, we were the world's darling and role model for everybody. We've come full circle since then. And so the next section I write is the Babylon of the last days. Theologians have written for generations about two manifestations of Babylon. Some of you already know this, but I want to make sure we understand. Uh, political Babylon and spiritual Babylon. I'm going to make sure I, I didn't do that before. I'll define that a little bit more carefully today. Uh, the commentary that I'm going to borrow from is from the editors of Indoweb, retrieved just December 19th, in an article called Religious and Political Babylon, appropriately enough. Commentary in, Babylon, in Revelation 17 and 18. Have your Bibles ready today. It'll be good, or whenever you, you study this stuff, if you dare. Respectively, John mentions two Babylons that will rise to prominence shortly before the advent of Christ. That's why I stay excited. These are all harbingers. These are all signal flares. These are all shouts and blasts from God's trumpet. These are all roarings of a particular lion that I will end on today that I'm coming soon. And I know you've heard that, what, 40, 50 years? I'm convinced of it now, which is why my entire life and career and teaching direction and manner and tone <coughs> have changed radically in the last seven years. So the commentary says, in Revelation 17 and 18, respectively, John mentions two Babylons that will arise to prominence shortly before the advent of Christ. The one, first one is mystical Babylon, referring to an evil ideology or false system of religious worship, and the other a commercial city, political Babylon, with all kinds of worldly pleasure and immoral practices in it. Both of these chapters, which I commend to you to read very, very uh, uh, seriously, in Revelation are based upon the supposition that there will be a reconstructed Babylon. Now, don't let that mislead you. There are a lot of folks running around saying, let's go to Iraq and watch them reconstruct Babylon. Not happening. Not happening. It's a false flag. Even though there's some restoration activity going on. The one Babylon is called <clears throat> Mystery Babylon. In Revelation 17, the great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth, the false church. And the other one, Babylon, that mighty city in Revelation 18.10. Because the city of Babylon is the place of origin of the pagan religions, the apostate, <coughs> I recognize this now, the apostate, the apostate, <coughs> you ain't going to win, Satan. The apostate end time world religion with its unbiblical unification of all religions is aptly described as mystery Babylon. And there's a lot of conspiracy stuff going on about that. I think it's going to look quite different than what you might have imagined, including if not founded upon the Protestant church as well as the Catholic. So, you know, we're an equal opportunity indictment factory here. Uh, it is opposed to biblical Christianity. Look, if you're that much observant. You understand that those of us who are standing against where the American Protestant Church is going today, we're opposed to its opposition of canonical Christianity. And more and more, apparently, we're being, I won't use the word savaged yet, but that's coming. We're being opposed, we're being persecuted, we're being isolated, we're being marginalized, we're being mocked and ridiculed, fired. So it is opposed to biblical Christianity and is already in the process of establishing that conventional, economical body, you know, Jesus loves everybody all the time, don't worry about it. Or parent organization called the Mother of Harlots in Revelation 17.5. The woman rides on the back of something called the beast. Now, I, I read over a dozen articles. There's not entire agreement here. Some articles say that represents the Antichrist. Other articles say, as well documented, that it's the Antichrist's political system. I'm including both. So here I say the beast or Antichrist system. It's him and, him and, not either or. Best I can tell from the articles. And will be recognized, supported, and used by him. He will use the mother of harlots for his own purposes. And when he's done with her, it's another story. 
For centuries, Bible scholars have speculated then who these are. The conventional, the conventional view has been a reconstructed Babylon, literally in Iraq, and the Catholic Church as spiritual Babylon. Look, I'm not saying the Catholic Church is uh, sinless here, but neither is the Protestant Church. I've said that once or twice before already. So here's the American Babylon hypothesis that will lose me even more, friends. We start with an extremely controversial thesis published by, again, the late David Wilkerson in his book, Set the Trumpet to Thy Mouth, published in 1985. When I first read it, I thought the man was a lunatic. And I think I literally flipped the book over somewhere else. And I picked it up a few years later and read it again, and then several years later, if not a decade and a half later. And I thought, uh-oh, the old boy must have had something in mind from the Lord. Not that it, all of it was accurate, but anyway. In this work, elaborating upon a vision that he had and wrote about in 1973, Wilkerson proposes an America and church that in the 1980s hardly anyone recognized. Woo! Reagan was the president, the church was just glorious, and it was participating, and it was welcome in the White House, and gosh whiz, golly bang, America was, you know, rising again. Everything was sunshine. And then Wilkerson comes along and pokes right in the eye of American church leaders and political leaders and says this, he wrote this, I believe modern Babylon is present-day America. What? I know when I read it, I thought, you know, the guy needs to be committed. Including its corrupt society and its whorish, whorish church system. No other nation, he writes, on the earth fits the description in Revelation 18 but America. The world's biggest fornicator with the merchants of all nations. America is going to be destroyed by fire. He goes on to talk about a nuclear holocaust or hydrogen. Unexpectedly in one hour will engulf America and this nation will be no more. It is because America has sinned. This is an interesting line. It is because America has sinned against the greatest light. We have less excuse than any other nation on the planet for screwing it up and violating the canon and the gospel. We have less excuse. We have been the greater light for generations. We are no longer the greater light, beloved. Caveat, it's important to note, again, uh, Wilkerson's prophecies didn't all come true, so he's not, that's why I don't call him a prophet. I don't call any human being a prophet, certainly not this old curmudgeon. What we do is operate in the examination of prophetic literature, according, if you're a continuationist, then we, there, there's a continuation in the gift of prophecy, which is uh, we're given to study and understand things prophetic. But that's not the same as an office of the prophet or apostle or, you know, all of that nonsense from the NAR. That's gone. But the gifts are still in operation. That's my view. I've gradually come to, re to agree, somewhat reluctantly agree with Wilkerson on this project over over 41 years of following the Christ. So I came across an article years ago by R.A. Coombs, an, an eschatologist who spent years painstakingly doing what others have done, including my dear friend, uh, Brother Paul, on his Antichrist 45 channel. Uh, wonderful man. I recommend him. Please, please tune in to him. Uh, in aligning the characteristics of Mystery Babylon with the scriptures over a period of years. I'm just, I have 30 out of his 60. I'm not going to read them all. You can read them, and they're all proof texted. So, by the way, parenthetically, according to Wilkerson at least, if not the others, the city, which is the center of Babylon, is New York, according to this thesis. The chief city of Mystery Babylon, referenced later, is New York, is a deep water port city. Revelation 18, 30, I'm not going to say it all the scriptures, they're here in the text. The city is the key commercial nation, and, and number two, of wealth for the world's economy. Third, she is also known as the world's policeman, Jeremiah 50, 23, and you can look all this up. Down the list, it is also sensual, materialistic, and excessive in its lifestyle. It exhibits the highest living standards among the nations, no longer. Again, this is 1998. Again, it offers its citizens an elegant, sumptuous lifestyle. They're proof scriptures for every one of these. It is powerful and oppressive. It is a land of rebels in its birth. It is cosmopolitan and urban. It is a land of great agriculture and an international city. And you can read the whole 30 on your own time. I suggest you do. And get your Bibles up and look at the scriptures. In sum, while I fully realize how controversial all this is, 
I have come to find that Mr. Coombs' 1998 indictment of America and Wilkerson's 1985 indictment before him, and a few more before those two, is more compelling as I watch outside every day. I, I'm i concerned about myself. I mean, I do something as innocent as turn on a Christian radio station I mentioned before, as I did yesterday or today. And a little girl comes on and she says, you know, I know there are those of you who are, who are just having the hardest time, but Jesus is just about to do the most wonderful thing in your life you ever, you ever could imagine. Uh, is that true? She's not talking about the rapture. She's not talking about heaven. She's talking about this life right now. Well, Jesus is going to go by and just give out goodies to everybody, which is sacrilege. And I don't know the girl's name. I do know that most Christian radio stations hire these 20-somethings who are lovely little Christians who have the depth of a thimble, theologically. And they're handing out catchphrases and cliches that they've been taught by other people with thimble deep theological doctrinal training. And that's what we're caught in in so much of the church today. I don't mean to be unfair to Caleb and all the other people. There, I mentioned the other day there was one, uh, I think her name was Lori, just an extraordinary, probably a 30-something woman with some real sinew and depth to her, handing out meat and potatoes instead of this nonsense we hear. I wrote to Caleb and said, hire about 1,000 of those, please. The scripture again, don't, do not participate in the worthless and unproductive deeds of darkness, but instead expose them by exemplifying, hear me church, exemplifying personal integrity, moral courage, and godly character. I'm going to end on that note. For it is disgraceful even to mention the things in detail that such people practice in secret. By now it goes without saying that the arguments that I'm going to present today are in support of what I believe to be a divine prime directive for all true Christians. Leave Babylon now. Does that mean to move out of the United States? No, that's not necessarily what I'm saying, although I know a couple of very wonderful friends that are doing just that. By the way, there's an article out uh, just published twice on Drudge. Americans are leaving America at record numbers, guess, and it lists the countries where they're going. Guess where the first country is. Uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Americans are moving to Mexico, which I think is somewhat ironic given what's going on at the border with record numbers of immigrants uh, desperately trying to cross the border into America. And we got a bunch of Anglo-Saxons running down to Mexico to set up camp, save a lot of money, get out of taxes, and live like a king or a queen. What a country. Who used to say that? Yakov Smirnov, a Russian comedian. I don't know if he's still alive. What a country. So I'm going to break this down into the main ideas. And I'm personally put, uh, I'm uh, purposely putting exclamation points by each, by each one to emphasize the severity of God's commands here. Have no fellowship, explanation point. The word used here is from the Greek sugkoinoneo, to be a partaker with, become an accomplice with, to share or have company with, or be a partner of, closely identified, or substantially in alliance with, to communicate with, or commune with, results in sharing the same guilt as the sinners with whom you join. If you are a MAGA QAnon guy, and you're doing so by the name of Christ, you are now joined to devils. You are now joined to the demonic, and you'll be held accountable for it, and it nullifies the blood of Jesus by your own choice sustained over a period of years. With repentance, I believe you can come back, but if you don't repent, you're done. You're cooked. You'll fry. Terrible way to put it, but I'm just at the end of myself on this matter. You can't do that. I believe the apostle said, or it was Jesus, I can't remember where the passage is, you cannot sit at the table of the Lord and the table of demons. You can't do it. Or you can and suffer the consequences. Second, with works of darkness from the Greek skotos, a reference to obscurity or ignorance, which is rampant in the American church today. 
to be overcome by night and forced to stop sharing the light. You can't testify for Christ holding that demonic hand. Can't do it. Or you can try. People will scoff or they're already a member of the cult and think you're wonderful. Spiritual blindness, serious error, works practiced by men in darkness or secrecy, denotes infernal spirits opposed to Christ. I'm not making it up about the demonic. It's in the word. I can read, and so can you, and then I go to the original text as much as I can. Rather expose them. Now, here's, here's the deal. I'm a pretty severe guy. I used to be the nicest guy on the block. Oh, I used to tell jokes and long stories that made people smile. I remember one night I was speaking for the full gospel businessman, I don't know, somewhere in the Midwest. It was on the 18th of the month. And everything I said, there was about 140 people in the audience. Everything I said, people were just roaring and laughter and rolling on the floors. And I went out of that night and thought, God, that was great tonight, Lord. That's the best I've ever been. Wrong. Wrong. We had a good time. Nobody was saved. Nobody came up for prayer. But we had a great time. I haven't told that story ever before that I recall. Here we have the word elegko. I talked about this just last time. To reprove with conviction upon the offender. To rebuke discipline severely. How much of that is going on in the church today? To show to be guilty with solid, compelling evidence. To prove wrong. Bring to God's light. Chasten to convince of error, refute, confute, to chastise in a moral sense, to detect hidden things spoken in darkness, to convict thoroughly and expose them to the church. I don't know if I'm doing all this well, beloved. I don't. I have a teeny tiny little viewership or readership. Uh, you know, I'm a pin drop in an ocean. And people tell me all the time, you're much too angry, and I may be but I'm giving it every single ounce of effort and ability I have to wake people up, both inside the church and the ones who want to come to the true church and not go on the inside of those. Disgraceful to ignore, finally, the strong admonitions here is nothing less than a scandal in the eyes of God. There are tens of thousands of pastors in the pulpits today who God considers scandalous, scandalous. From the Greek, iskron, iskron, that which is indecorum, base, venal, filthy, shameful, reproachful, dishonorable, procuring shame, sinking in reputation, as with cowardice, which is a supreme disgrace in the eyes of God. Cowardice. Perhaps you military men and women can understand that word better than we. And why in the old days they had deserters shot at dawn or sometimes on site. No, I'm not advocating that. I'm just saying that's history about the severity of desertion. Commentary. Have no fellowship. This is from uh, Charles Ellicott, an exposition of the Old and New Testament for English readers, 1878. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but to keep no terms with them, none. Have nothing to do with the MAGA movement. Have nothing to do with QAnons. Have nothing to do with Trump nationalism. Stop it! Get out. Move away. And go back to Jesus and ask him what your next step would be. I'm not even asking you not to vote. I'm just saying be terrified by the alliances you form. There are consequences. The unfruitful... Oh, uh, being partakers with the sins of Babylon, rather reprove them. The unfruitful works of darkness. St. Paul has a similar antithesis in the epistle to the Romans. Those who are in sin yield their members, servants to iniquity. In other words, you, you give yourself over to Donald Trump. That's what you do. You give yourself over to him. And you cannot do that and hold the hand of Jesus Christ at the same time. I, I'm telling you, this is what he told me to teach. I know that's why I don't have many friends. I know that's why I don't get a great audience share. I know that's why, as imperfect as I am, I'm still telling you what he told me to tell you. You cannot hold Trump's hand and hold Jesus' hand and call it holy. You cannot, Pastor. Let them continue to do this. Remembering that every branch that 
beareth not fruit, he taketh away and throws into the fire. John 15, 2. Jesus said that. I didn't write the book, and I didn't give him his script. Rather, reprove them in order to convince and convict. It is not enough to have no fellowship with those people. It is to, if you love somebody, you tell them the truth. You don't have to yell at them like I do all the time, or much of the time. <coughs> There's a way to do it. I have two friends. I won't name them. <coughs> two friends who are Trumpers, and we have good conversation. Only two out of all the ones I've known, the rest have called me all kinds of names and left, including former students at Liberty, Regent University, and everybody, and CBF. But there are two that I keep commerce with and concourse with. We're talking. And those two are, I think, representative of perhaps somebody in your life, maybe in the family, that the Lord said, you know, just hang on, tell them in firm but loving terms what the truth is in, in little doses. A spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. What's that, what's that movie from? I have a section here now, the timidity of the American church is shameless in my view, but one of the great travesties of American Christianity is found in its new gospel command to never criticize another believer, especially a pastor. I've read articles as recently as, don't you dare criticize your pastor. He's God's representative on the earth. Holy mother of China. I'm not sure I'm supposed to say that. But, or that there is a mother of China and she's holy. But, Had Martin Luther not nailed his incendiary 95... Have you ever read the 95 Theses nailed to the door at Wittenberg? Read them sometime. They keep you up at night. Or the Declaration of Independence. Read the indictment sometime. They keep you up at night. These were not kind Christians and gentle little polite gent gentlemen with, you know, powdered wigs on their hands. These were warriors for the truth. And that's what we must be in these last days. I recently came across an obscure but courageous little piece <clears throat> by someone named Steve Sims. Couldn't find him anywhere, <clears throat> but I liked what he wrote. In an article likewise titled, If Luther Could Criticize, Why Can't We? He writes this, opening line. I loved it. Any condemnation that has come on you for sincerely questioning a pastor is not from God. Be healed and be free to... Two words, if I stop right here, be the most important thing, to follow Jesus. What's that song? I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided. Those two words pack an enormous amount of biblical, theological, canonical wisdom. To really follow Jesus will cost you. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Never judge. We've already been over this ground. But the reason we're supposed to judge inside the house is to keep the house clean. Not the other. Well, here, here are uh, ba, 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 two quick crisp, uh, scriptures I probably mentioned before. Jesus taught this. Do not judge by appearance, superficially and arrogantly, but judge fairly and righteously, John 7, 24. Paul follows this with... Ba, 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 what, for what business is it of mine to judge outsiders, non-believers? Do you not judge those who are within the church to protect the church as the situation requires, Pastor? You can't keep holstering your pistols for your other brethren and leaders who are sending people to the abyss. You can't do that. You'll be held accountable twice as much, three times as much, ten times as much as the rest of us. On fleeing Babylon then, getting down to the nitty-gritty. Here I maybe wax a little silly, I'm not so sure, but out of all the recording artists in the 1960s and early 70s, my favorite were clearly and arguably Paul Simon and Art Garfunkel. I love their music to this day. I still listen to it. Poet prophets in their own way, they were Jews, but they had a the pulse. I think one of the greatest songs ever written was Sounds of Silence. Listen to it in their version or even in oh that that very tough version by uh, the the rock artist i can't remember his name you know who it is 
It's an extraordinary song, prophetic in every way. Watch the video. The music was brilliant, but one of the sillier ones that I remember when I was writing this, 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover, <clears throat> or person, or thing, or event, or cause, or church. Just slip out the back, Jack. Make a little plan, Stan. You don't need to be coy, Roy. You just get yourself free. Hop, hop on the bus, Gus. You don't need to discuss much. Just drop off the Keeley and get yourself free. Not of a relationship that was toxic. Well... Yeah, a church that's toxic, a church that is unfaithful, a pastor that is untrue, and a coward. Someone who tortures the gospel and reconfigures it and reconstructs it into a universalism. You know, God loves you no matter what you do, say, or think. I've read articles by leading Christian writers who say that to their demise. The call then. I say again here, God is issuing a trumpet blast at this point. This is Christmas Eve, 2022. I don't know. I'm not trying to be a prophet. I'm just saying, God led me to teach this. And yeah, I wrestle. Well, come on, Lord, it's Christmas Eve. Can't we talk about baby Jesus and swaddling clothes and frankincense, golden myrrh, and you know. His silence was deafening. Here's what the Lord is saying, as far as I'm concerned from Isaiah 52, 11, and 12. I'll probably not turn up the volume. The words are sufficient. Depart. Depart. Go out from there, the lands of exile. Touch no unclean thing. Go out of the midst of her, which is Babylon. Cleanse yourselves and be clean, you who bear the vessels of the Lord on your journey from there. For you will not go out with haste, nor will you go in flight, as was necessary when Israel left Egypt, for the Lord, for those of you who will obey this call, for the Lord will go before you and the God of Israel will be your rear guard. You won't have to worry about what's going to happen to you, although it's a terrifying thing to follow this command. Lucid commentary on this is offered by the brilliant Joseph Benson, writing in 1811. Depart ye, go out ye from thence, explanation point, out of Babylon in your own land, Touch no unclean thing. Carry not along with you any of the superstitions or idolatries or false teachings or false teachers of the world. Leave them in the dust. Jesus actually taught, shake the dust from your sandals and leave them in contempt. Jesus teaches this stuff, but I, I'm not, I'm taking the literal scriptures and trying to relate them to you because we haven't heard them in the longest time. The practical application, leave Babylon. What does that mean? Pack my things and go to Mexico, Malawi, Mediterranean, Malta. Not at all necessarily. We're talking much more about something inside, I think. As always, the scriptures are our rudder and two in particular come to mind. Now this is going to be an even stronger blow to some of our perhaps earlier presuppositions about what it is to follow Christ. 1 Corinthians 15 31 Paul writes to the church I assure you by the pride which I have in you for standing term, standing firm standing true your fellowship and union with Christ Jesus our Lord that I die daily I face death every day and die to myself. I can relate. Second, Revelation 12, 11, And they overcame and conquered him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony, for they did not love their life and renounce their faith, faith even when faced with death. Most of us have prayed that prayer. Lord, would I be brave enough to do that? Not on your own, but by the Holy Spirit's entrance upon that situation, yeah. Commentary here is from the editors of Got Questions. I still like them, even though they're cessationists. They've got a lot of good commentary. We too can say I die daily. Paul was totally sold out to God. That's it. You can read the rest of it in detail. How do I, how do I get that across to you? And because it's frankly only been my experience for the last few years that I've been able to do this. Be totally sold out to God. My first 35 years were 
I think I think it was saved, but it was partial in the sense that my commitment levels were were always balanced by my need for material things or position or or approval. I had a lot of gods in my life. Still have some, but got rid of quite a few. <laughs> I'm laughing at the way the Lord dealt with me. So there's an ultimate question that flows from this, beloved. I'm going to begin to end on it. During the process of drafting my first book, my first version of the Sixth Seal, six, seven, seven years ago, I recall, I've told the story before, a particular morning when God said, Son, are you willing to die for me? I was stunned by the question. I heard it loud and clear. And I mumbled something like, Uh... Well, uh, this is in 2015. Uh, can I get back to you on that, Lord? Just get back to you on that. Months rolled by. I don't know how many. That question kept tearing at my heart, my mind, my memory. Kept trying to, frankly, dispense with it. And finally, I got to the point, and I don't remember the details. Something just went inside of me. And I went back to the Lord and said, yes, Lord. I'm willing to die for you. I'm willing to die for you. Could have been even years. I'm reflecting now from 2015, probably to about 2017, as I saw the rollout of this new Christianity and I saw the folding of the entire church leadership. I became more and more disgusted with that. At the same time, I fell more and more in love with Christ. Does that make any sense? To the point where I said, yeah, I'd rather die for you than join this. The principle, complete freedom in Jesus Christ will only be possible when you are no longer afraid of death and dying. You won't have it until then. As long as you're afraid of losing all this, you won't be fully his. You can't be. I'm not even saying you're saved, not saved. I'm going to leave that to the greater minds, although I have a pretty strong opinion about it. Unless you're sold out 105,000% to Jesus, I don't think you're really saved. I don't. Fully sanctified. We'll smooth it over with that. Any more than I was for 35 years. I was saved. I was preaching, sharing testimony, leading to people to Christ, teaching in a Christian university or two. I was a Christian, but now I'm different. I don't know what the difference is. I fumble around because this is all so new to me and I'm not trying to make up a cult of new Christianity. I'm just saying I'm trying to hearken back to the original text, the original charge, the original gospel. Jesus said, if you really love me, you will obey my commands. So I tell you the absolute truth here when Paul wrote about dying to self. He wasn't just whistling Dixie. He was giving the disciples their existential keys to the kingdom. You cannot serve Jesus unless you fully die to self. I've got a wonderful picture that I'm, I didn't put up. It's a, a stormy uh, mountaintop. The wind is blowing. There's a banner flapping in the wind. There's a fire with the wind blowing it across. And it's, it's Abraham with knife raised above Isaac. And just at the point when he begins to plunge the knife, tearing his own heart and life apart, the angel of the Lord says, Stop! If we're not willing to give up everything that we love more than Jesus, we don't get to go. That goes for Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all the disciples, all the Christians of the early church, medieval church, and today's church. If there's anything that you love more than Jesus, you don't get to go. So as I matriculated in what I derisively called the American gospel over a period of 40 years, <clears throat> I heard all the time, Becoming a Christian costs you nothing. The price has already been paid. Technically, if you squint up your eyes real tight, yeah. 
Bonhoeffer had something to say about that in his classic Cost of Discipleship, published in 1937. Cheap grace means grace sold on the market like cheap jacks wares. The sacraments, the forgiveness of sin, and the consolations of religion are thrown away at cut prices. Grace is represented as the church's inexhaustible treasury from which she showers blessings with generous hands on everybody without asking questions or fixing limits. Grace without price. Grace without cost. The essence of grace we suppose in that the account has been paid in advance and because it has already been paid, everything can be had for nothing since the cost was infinite. The possibilities of using and spending it are infinite. What would grace be if it were not cheap? Costly grace is the gospel which must be sought and again and again, the gift which must be asked for, the door at which a man must knock over and over again. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow, and it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs a man his life, and it is grace because it gives a man the only true life there is to be. It is costly because it condemns sin and grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it costs God the life of his son. You were bought at a price. And what has cost God much cannot be cheap for us, beloved. Above all, it is grace because God did not reckon his son to dear a price to pay for our life, but delivered him up for us costly grace is the very incarnation of God. If I'm correct in any of this, it is left to us then in the last days on this Christmas Eve 2022 with what's coming. Not so much to save a nation anymore. No, I'm quoting the great saint here, Bonhoeffer, because America is becoming rapidly a fourth Reich. I don't want to save that any more than Bonhoeffer wanted to save Germany. It is that church and that church alone that Christ will be enemy to, but he will be friend to and rescuer of and protector of and benefactor toward the remnant church, the true church. What was the confessing church in Nazi Germany, but by the end of the war it had dwindled to almost a handful including Bonhoeffer, who was still with it. So I close with Matthew 16, 18, the words of Jesus. And on this rock, meaning himself, Greek Petra, a huge rock like Gibraltar, that wasn't Peter. I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, the powers of the infernal region, shall not overpower it or be strong to its detriment or hold out against it. It is that church that Jesus refers to as the remnant, the true church of Jesus Christ. So what are we called to, beloved? In these last of the last days, this last hour, unto courage, we are called unto truth, We are called unto compassion. We are called unto honor. And we are called unto endurance to the very end. Because all those who will endure will be saved according to our Messiah. These are the hallmarks of the faith faith that must steer us in this hour. The lion is roaring, beloved. But can anyone hear him? Father, I've done what I can to honor your command to tell the people leave Babylon while there is still some time I don't think I've done my best but I've done it and I thank you now to let this message bear fruit in pastors and penitents and congregants and outsiders and insiders whoever is going to listen to this family members who've been on the fence it really is the most loving message I could possibly give. It is a message to save their lives, not just this life, but their eternal lives, though they may lose this one. 
Their eternal lives are guaranteed. Saw something on TV just a moment ago before I came on. I think it was Francis Chan. I know he's controversial, but I love the illustration. He had a long rope, maybe 50 feet long, white rope. And at the end was this little two or three inch long red piece that represented our lives here on earth. And he got a laugh out of the audience. Why are you concentrating so much on this? The end, the left side of this tiny little red piece and leaving all of eternity, the other 50 feet to chance. Father, I thank you for whatever you can use, whatever words you can speak, whatever things have been written, whatever illustrations that might be constructed, whatever shouts and whispers and trumpet blasts and wooings of the Holy Spirit to bring people to the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help us, God. Father, I wish I'd done better, but I've done what I can. The rest is up to you, Holy Spirit, and each person's choice. We love you and we thank you. And may God truly bless all those who seek the real Jesus this Christmas and into the new year. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Love you guys. Talk to you soon.